All right, so let me do a very quick introduction. We're gonna jump right into it. So um, Chief Winokur is my client, uh, as, as is Moraga Rinda Fire District that he is the chief of. Um, he is, um, I don't wanna make him blush, but he is probably uh, one of the smartest uh, public servants that I have I've, uh, ever worked with. I'm gonna give his resume a little bit in reverse order because it's gonna explain a little bit, I think, of, of, of him. Um, he is a colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve uh, and um, um, is very, very active uh, there. And I, I suspect some of his uh, problem solving ability may have come from his roots in, in, in the military. Uh, he is currently uh, the chief of Maragarinda Fire District. He was, I think, an assistant chief or deputy chief. Uh, division chief. Division chief uh, in, in the, for the Alameda County uh, Fire uh, Department, Fire District, uh, and has become a, a real leader um, on both a technological level and um, uh, really on an organizational level uh, um, around uh, fuels mitigation uh, efforts, but also uh, around um, uh, developing technology uh, to address wildfire uh, in terms of uh, modeling its spread and doing other things, uh, all from his seat or stand, as the case may be, uh, where he where he is right now in his in 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 his office. So um, he's um, kind of a a, a a remarkable innovator, uh, and 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 by the way, I think so far quite successful at it as well. He's developing uh, very good political skills as well. He now has a following that uh, initially he um, sort of whipped up to support what he was doing and now they're in danger of eating us alive. Uh, they're, they're, the good news is they're activated. The bad news is <laughs> that their expectations are very high. Uh, in any event, so uh, we're gonna start with the chief talking about some of the stuff he's been working on and doing and then after that we'll, we'll do questions. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate uh, the opportunity and, and obviously this audience. Um, when John asked me, one of the things I was very excited about this opportunity is you all clearly um, academically uh, have standouts and your interest in public policy um, coming from your backgrounds. So we need more of that. We need more smart, engaged people in this space because uh, as John mentioned, um, I may be some of those things, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that the bar is pretty low. And we have failed, I think, writ large to attract and retain the best and the brightest in public service. And as a result of that, sometimes um, we get what we pay for and, and we, we are very quickly outpaced by vendors and private technology and other people who ought to be, um, because we're writing the checks, ought to be serving our broader goals. And often we end up just accepting whatever it is they're pushing. So I appreciate the opportunity, um, and let's uh, let me try to share a screen here, and let's walk through some things here. All right, so screen shared. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is is sort of the broader issue of what we've been doing in the wildland fire risk mitigation, uh, and and that being a really expansive definition of the term, not just how do we put the fires out, because there are going to be fires that exceed our capacity to suppress them. Therefore, we need to think full cycle about how we reduce not only fire starts, but the substrate on which fires spread, how we get people, uh, the values at risk, rapidly out of the way of a fire, and then how do we share information across political boundaries? Because emergencies, especially at the scale of wildfires we've seen in California the last several years, they don't respect political boundaries. And so the fact that we can all be very parochial and, and very inwardly focused when it comes to things like revenue measures and um, what time you can start doing construction and all those other silly little things that local control manifests itself in. All of those that, that we cherish during normal times, all of those inhibit our ability to provide a seamless response to a large scale emergency. So it's important that we understand how to create a common operating picture that breaks down not only inter-service barriers between say police and fire um, or office of emergency services or public works or any of the other for that matter, Caltrans and uh, CHP, or any other of the alphabet soup of agencies that have to effectively interact in real time, but also across political boundaries, because the fire doesn't recognize those, just like a flood or an earthquake doesn't. And, and in normal steady state operations, we do a very poor job of working together. And so we have to figure out ways to break that down. So without any further ado, 
let's take a look at these are the four areas um, that I'd like to talk about today. First, when it comes to fire, we're going to briefly define the threat as in this is what the fire problem looks like. Uh, generally speaking, people who have not seen fire have an idea of something mixed between backdraft and Godzilla uh, coming down the hill and, and ripping homes from their foundations and tossing them in the air. And while that's certainly possible, uh, that's the exception, not the rule. Next is we'll talk about the unique intersection of various initiatives where local government have the ability to act as an innovation hub. And there's some constraints and restraints there. And there's some things we're pretty good at. Uh, and there's some conditions that support innovation. And then there's some things that make it very, very challenging to execute. And we'll talk about um, some back and forth there. And then I'll give you the wave tops on some of the things we're working on. Uh, as John alluded to, there's a lot of them. Um, and we, we, we are churning out new ideas at the rapid rate, um, some of which don't work or work, but can't um, just don't gain traction for every reason. So I'll walk you through some of the things we're doing with an emphasis on the public private partnership element. Because uh, at the end of the day, um, I can't code and no one who works for me can code, but a lot of things we're relying on to execute and implement the vision require someone who can code. And quite frankly, we can't afford to hire someone who could. So seeking out those um, private partnerships to bring, to harness their resources that are lying latent, specifically existing products and things that are already in circulation that we can harness and repurpose to serve a, a public safety uh, role. And then lastly, just talk briefly about, uh, as John alluded to, uh, I've been in the Marine Corps now for 24 years. I'm a regimental commander in the reserves. Uh, I'm also the only infantry officer from Berkeley. If you meet another one, he's lying to you. Uh, and so we'll talk about a little bit about how the, the intersection of these two roles that I, I feel, um, having seen what uh, federal level things are capable of, and specifically inside the Marine Corps, which is probably the most agile um, of the services, and, and compare that to what um, we can and can't do in local government. So uh, without any further ado, uh, let's, um, let's drop right in here. So first, we'll start talking about defining the threat. So in California, before Europeans arrived and not only disrupted the previous ecosystem, but imported a number of non-native plants, which did not make the problem better, and built a whole bunch of values at risk that, that caused us to aggressively suppress fire. Prior to Europeans arriving, to one and a half and three and a half million acres per year burn. And that's on a recurring cycle of three to five years, give or take, in the Mediterranean counties, the, the coastal counties uh, of California, or on about a 25-year cycle up in uh, the Sierra Nevada range. And what that recurring cyclical burn cycle did was it cleared out all the stuff, the things that will burn, that deposit and grow. And, and so you had very large trees, widely spread out with very little understory because fire ran through from time to time. And every time the fire ran through, it consumed the available fuel, which meant the next fire was less intense. However, starting around 1908, we systematically excluded fire from the landscape as a result of really mismanagement of the forests. And while we excluded fire, we did not stop photosynthesis. So you've continued to see a development and accumulation of combustible material. And for a lot of years, where we were very aggressive about suppressing fire, we kept the, the burn averages really low, like half a million acres low for California. And in 2017 and 2018, and in some other years, really the bill came due. And we saw this regression to the mean is all of a sudden, we get these blockbuster burn rates compared to the last 100 years, but right in line with the historical average meaning that the, the fires we saw in 17 and 18 that we thought were the worst ever were in fact just approaching the historical average. And, and that's not counting, that's not making up for all the years that we didn't burn anything. So we still have this huge problem of accumulated fuels on the ground. At the same time, we've built approximately 3 million homes with an estimated 11 million occupants in the wildland urban interface area. So these are places where we've put values at risk, both lives and property, in the middle of this freight train of fire that we've exacerbated by disrupting the natural cycles that remove fuel from the environment. Not only did we do all of that, but we didn't build them to known best practices for ember resistant construction. As in, since the Bates bill, AB 38 came out in the 90s in response to the Oakland Hills firestorm, we have had construction standards further refined in 2007 via uh, 337 and Chapter 7A of the Building and, and the Residential Construction Codes, we know how to build ember-resistant construction. We've just lacked the political will to do so. 
And if you look it up in Paradise, California, where the campfire was in 2018, the over 50% of the homes that were built to ember resistant construction standards did not burn. On the other hand, 89% of those that were not did. So we know how to solve this problem. We just lack the political will to do it. And then lastly, climate change has compressed the historical rainy season. So historically in California, sometime around May or June, the rainy season came to a close and sometime between September and October, it started to rain again. And so we had a relatively long Mediterranean-like climate where there was no rain. But with climate change, we've seen a compression. So we're still most years getting about the same total amount of rain, but it's just falling in a much more compressed manner, which is why in 2017, the Thomas fire, which was one of the largest fires in California history, burned in December. And which is why in a lot of these years, by March, it's done raining. So if you take a look at the amount of time we have to be exposed to a fire start, if we compress the rain, we increase the number of months that things can burn. And most importantly, in the fall, when the Diablo wind events in Northern California or the Santa Ana winds down south, which is the movement of very dry air out of the Great Basin, when those wind events occur, those used to be an anomaly, that those occurred before the onset of the rainy season. Now that's becoming an every year event. So if you look at the slide I have up here, on the left side, we see where the wildfire hazard severity classes are. So red's bad. Orange is not quite so bad. Yellow is still bad, but, but, deal, but we can live with it. So if we look from Sacramento, if you look up and to the right, where that big mass of red encroaches down into the valley, that's the area where paradise is. And if you look over on the slide on the right, or the picture on the right there, you see the precipitation anomaly during the period that the campfire burned. And so as we have built these communities in very high wildfire hazard severity zones, at the same time, on the day that the campfire started in 2018, that area was at between minus four and minus five inches from the 30 year mean. Meaning that in a normal year, three to five inches of water would have fallen out of the sky and would be lying on the ground, wetting down the fuels and the substrate that fires burn on. And when that hot material fell off those PG&E utility lines, they would have landed in a puddle and no one ever would have known. Just like hot things have fallen off utility lines for the hundred years they've been up, that would have occurred without no harm, no foul, except it happened to occur during the fall, prior to the onset of the rainy season, during a Diablo wind red flag event, meaning that that area was getting 100 to 120 mile an hour ridge top winds and single digit humidity. And then all of a sudden, that mixture of backdraft and Godzilla was created, and this man-eating monster blew through and eliminated an entire community. All right, so as we talked about before, we've disrupted the natural cycle. After we disrupted the natural cycle by excluding fire, we then grazed heavily by putting cows out around. Cows ate down the vegetation. But as we have moved homes into these areas and created subdivisions and ranchettes and all the other things we've built, over time, we've excluded the cattle as well. Compounding that, we've added significant numbers of non-native trees and other vegetation that is not well adapted to this area. And as a result of that, is very prone to fire. Once we put homes and the residents who live in those homes in this area, we now have an imperative to put the fire out. So if you look at forest management techniques that they use up in the National Park Service and, and in some areas of the National Forest, they let naturally occurring fires burn because it's part of the natural cycle. Well, that works well and good if you're in Yosemite, you're ringed by granite, and there's nothing built there outside of the valley. Sure, let it burn, no hard feelings. You can imagine that, well, I'd be calling John for a job if I let a fire burn here as it ripped through the suburban community that the fire district exists specifically to protect from this threat. As we talked about climate change, and then the last piece here is that every year this problem gets worse. So this isn't a one and done. And, and when you look at the way federal grants work and um, local government allocations work, it's easy to get one-time money, but this is not a problem that can be solved by one-time money. This is a problem that's gonna require enduring commitment of both people and attention and money to resolve. And everybody's got their head in the sand. And those who have become aware, as John referenced with our, our local um, now interest groups that are getting involved in this, they are deeply committed to someone else addressing the problem. And this problem is, is as a running joke, is everyone agrees something should be done. And everyone could agree someone should do something. And that's about where the consensus falls apart. Because when you get down to personal accountability, this is your property, this is your parcel, these are your trees, 
you need to do something about it, people lose interest in the conversation very quickly. And then the last, look at bullet seven there is fire spread. Fire spreads between, um, in two manners. One is the ground component. That's the linear movement of fire from item to item. And the second is three-dimensional ember cast. And that's blown firebrands or embers, or sparks, if you will, that can travel miles in advance of the flaming front. And when they land, if they land on a receptive fuel bed, on dead grass, on a pile of leaves, those sort of things, they can quickly create a fire in their own right. And that's not a problem that can be addressed by any sort of macro project to do create a fuel break or something like that, because the embers just fly right over the top. So um, for those of you who are familiar with the area, Highway 24 is the, the green um, line that runs from top right to bottom left on the picture there. The, the outlines, those are the history of fires that we have in this, have had in this area. And there's, there's three fires I'd like to call out to your attention. There's the blue 1923 fire. Uh, that at the time, that was the Berkeley Hills fire. That was the most destructive fire in California state history at the time it burned. It held that record until 1991 when the tunnel fire, which is shown in green and sort of center in the picture there, burned down uh, from above Highway 24 down through the Oakland and Berkeley Hills. It, it, that held its distinction as the most destructive fire until recently eclipsed by some of the more recent fires. But you'll note that both the 1923 and the 1991 fires, which burned during the fall when they were driven by Diablo wind events, those fires have this big sort of amoeba-like shape. And what those fires were characterized by was initial rapid spread for about 12 hours or so until the wind event lifted. And then they slowly sort of burned around the perimeter until they largely extinguished themselves because they were no longer driven by wind and they just couldn't move to uh, beyond the fuel bed they were currently in. In contrast, look at the 1937 fire. It runs from, it ran from the west to the east. It was a wind-driven fire during the summer months. And in 1937, over that very rough and um, tangled terrain that defines the, the Sibley um, Oakland Hills area, in 1937, there were not thousands of well-trained firefighters that were able to quickly get a line around that. That fire went out when the fog came in and a big wet blanket was put on top of that party and the fire just went out. And so we, we offer that up to say that the fire itself is not necessarily the issue. The issue is what time of year it occurs, what fuel bed it is in, and what values at risk line it's passed. That 1937 fire bothered nobody because those portions of the hills hadn't been built yet and the fog put it out before it spread into what was the then very small community of Orinda. So I offer this up to say that all fires are not created equal. And it's important when you look at this or you look at any other similar problem that you break the problem down as component parts and you do some analysis of how this fire or this problem was created, what are the things we can do to reduce the risk, and what are the most cost-effective things that have the greatest return on the investment and are the most politically palatable. And if you can answer all those, if all those come out, it's low cost, high impact, and either no one cares or everyone is in violent alignment that this is a good idea, well then those are the sort of things to move forward on because when we move forward looking for the perfect, uh, we very quickly discover the perfect just cannot be achieved in uh, the local government context. So having defined the threat that those are the problems, that's the fire problem as we see it in this area. It's a wind-driven fire during a Diablo wind event, which comes out of the north or northeast during the fall months. And of the two components, the, one of those is the ground component, and that can be slowed or stopped by construction of a fuel break. So last year, with about four and a quarter million dollars from uh, in state money through the governor's um, priority projects list, we created a 19.3 mile fuel break covering about 1,500 acres. It's shown in the little bit in the colored lines there and here you see it outlined in red. Using uh, that governor, the state money, we did it in 89 days um, with about 45 days notice. So for any of you who have done any projects in government, I will tell you, I defer to John to back me up on this. Um, unheard of is a little bit of an understatement. Right? The projects don't move at that scale and at that speed in government. Um, and so we were able to rapidly construct this fuel break. But as I referenced above, the fuel break, the fuel break doesn't address blown embers. That, that's we are reliant on private property owners to do that. And we'll hold that thought, we'll come back to that. In addition to the fuel break, oh, there we go. We're making aggressive use of prescribed fire. We're returning fire to the landscape. And here you see crews out constructing a burned line. Uh, we refer to that as the black. Once it's been burned, it will not burn again. Right? The green, which is the stuff around it, will burn until it's burned once. But, if it, just for, I, well, I just assume everyone knows this, um, politically, very unpalatable to put fire on the ground. Everyone's afraid of fire. 
And then you walk into this alphabet soup of regulatory agencies, air quality, fish and wildlife, water uh, shed managers, air shed managers, all of whom have a, a specific and very narrow mandate to protect whatever it is the one thing they're worried about is. So um, Fish and Wildlife comes out and says, oh, you can't burn because this is nesting bird season. So that entire time is off limits. And when you get out of nesting bird season, well, now you're into times when air quality is worried about the parts per million. And by the time you get done with that, now you're getting into it's about to start raining and the watershed managers and the fish and wildlife folks are opposed to any burning that might increase sedimentation of surface waters in violation of CEQA. And by the time you get done, it's pretty easy just to do nothing. Uh, because there are all these impediments from people with a single focus and, and a mandate, which is not subject to review, and interestingly, is not subject to state oversight. Um, so John helped me get a, a editorial in the Chronicle about a year and a half ago, pointing out that PFERS, which is the state pre prescribed fire incident reporting system, has not been adopted by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. So in this day and age, if you want to do a prescribed fire inside Bay Area Air Quality Management District's purview, you have to download a non-fillable PDF form. No one's got a typewriter anymore, so you got to fill it out by hand. Then you have to fax it, and that represents a real hurdle because we're not even find a fax machine anymore. So then you have to fax it Bay Area Air Quality, where irony of ironies, they down they they print it out and then they type it into a system that's based on PFERS. So if you pause and think about that for a minute, and that's just so we can do the right thing. And you have to send them a check for the privilege of being able to burn in your own jurisdiction and put particulate matter into the air that they control. So just as an example of how the system is not built to encourage things to be done, uh, the system is, is built to prevent things from being done, which is fine within the narrow mandate under which they were created, uh, but starts to fall apart when you're attempting to create a holistic solution. Um, here's an example of burning we've done. You'll note on the left, um, those are in immediate proximity to homes. Um, this, is a, this is really where the, the rubber meets the road. Fuel mitigation done, work done in proximity to homes is by far the most effective. On the other hand, it's the most risky uh, and it generates the most public interest. Um, in that picture on the left, the second house, they missed all the notices and the things we put on the door saying we were going to burn. They left their windows open, smoke got into the house. Uh, I had to go apologize to the homeowners personally uh, because we put smoke into their house because they didn't pay attention to the flyers we put on their door saying we were going to burn. So it's just a long way of saying this stuff is hard, uh, but there really isn't any better alternative. Oops. All right. So we talk about um, opportunities for innovation and we're going to get into a whole bunch of the things we're doing um, in the tech space to help amplify the work we're doing in the fuel reduction space. Uh, local government has the ability to innovate based on its size, as in there's not a whole lot of oversight. There is this mosaic of local government entities, most of which are relatively poorly supervised and therefore have the flexibility to, to try new things. Uh, that's on the good side. On the downside, uh, you don't get promoted for innovating, you get fired for innovation gone wrong. And generally speaking, that risk aversion spirit spreads across everything we do and, and people have no incentive to try something new. It's well, we hire a consultant, the consultant comes and takes our watch, tells us what time it is and doesn't give us our watch back. Right? So there's just not a, a culture of innovation baked in um, and there's not, they're not the, the staffing and the resources. There's no such thing as a local government uh, below say the San Francisco or LA scale that has an R&D department, that has people and resources dedicated to innovation and trying new things. Uh, basically, all of our budgets are built around keeping the lights on, on steady state maintenance of effort operations. Um, during the best of times, there's a little bit of extra money available and that usually goes to either capital projects or um, pay, pay and benefits, and that's about it. Um, there is always a recession looming around the door. There are the, um, the growing demands of unfunded pension liabilities and OPEB payments. All of which come together to say that while local government has the opportunity and the, the space in which to innovate, it's just not structurally built for it. And that's why I think it's so important that the public-private partnership element is emphasized because private industry has the ability to innovate. They have the requirement to innovate to stay relevant if you're talking in the right sectors and they have a real hunger to do something to help. And in the Bay Area particularly, we have a large number of tech firms that, that have the resources, they have the interest, they have the staff, and they have the mandate, sometimes formally, to do things that help. 
we need to harness them because otherwise we end up in the, with the usual suspects of um, vendors who come to sell us whatever it is they've already built, but do just enough customization to make it clunky, unwieldy, and very expensive. Um, and, and then tie our hands to endless series of updates and, um, and improvements that may or may not be needed. So there's a real opportunity when, when partnering um, with private industry to do some things, but that you have to be able to speak the language. Uh, you have to be able to gain entree. Um, I, I will just say, suffice it to say, I've been trying to break in with Google for about the last two years. I've had a series of meetings that never end up going anywhere because I'm not talking to the right people. And we'll talk a little bit about how all this stuff nests within some existing systems. But point being is that um, folks like yourselves, uh, impressive academic records, um, having the law degree, having an understanding uh, of how to navigate complex systems of people uh, are critical to figuring out how we can identify these partnership opportunities so that we can harness the existing technology or tweak it slightly to meet the local government need and really start to do some good because otherwise we end up being outpaced um, by private industry and, and you end up with these uh, bifurcated efforts. And on one hand, government's doing one thing, the other private industry is doing another and they're operating in the same space and, and conflict in that space is inevitable as a result. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of the things we're doing in the tech space. So uh, the first one we've been working on is early detection and notification. As a reference with the campfire, uh, that started at a point when some hot molten things fell off utility lines. And at that point, those things hit the ground, there was a very small fire burn. And that very small fire at that point could have been put out with a modicum of effort. Yet because of the conditions and the fuel bed it was on, it very quickly spread and reached a size and intensity that it could not be stopped. So the key of this initiative is we want to find ways to detect fires while they're small, so we can rapidly aggregate the effective firefighting force to put them out. At the same time, we can rapidly begin the process of organizing an effective and um, rapid time-based evacuation system so we can move all the humans in the way of the fire out of it to one, protect their lives, and two, sanitize the space so firefighters have the ability to operate. In doing this, we've been really looking for industry partners and existing tech. Uh, it's just not possible for us to build something new. Um, so. It's just not in the cards, we don't have the money, we don't have the time, uh, and we don't have um, the dedicated staff to really sit there and, and develop something new. But as we looked around, we found all of these existing systems, initiatives, hardware companies that were doing parts of what we needed. It just wasn't being brought together because no one had looked at it with a comprehensive view of what's the end state desired? What do we want this to look like when we are done? And, and that's what we've done. Um, we've, we've really, we've taken all these parts, we've, we've glommed them all together and some things are coming out of it with some uh, very generous funding from primarily from the Moore Foundation that are allowing it to move forward. Um, and the, the third and fourth items are, I think are the most important. Um, in government, there are always going to be vendors who come offering to sell you a one-off solution. Uh, and that one-off solution is going to be very expensive and it's not gonna work very well and you will now be tied to that vendor uh, will now own your data, which is often hidden away somewhere in the contract that in, by agreeing to use their platform, you're handing over your data. And now you're locked in and you've invested too much time to train your folks how to use it. Um, it would be too expensive and time consuming to off ramp. And you're locked into this thing that's not really right um, and is not able to innovate. And to get to where we want to be, it means try, discard, try again, wash, rinse, repeat, do it over and over again. But uh, as either you have seen or will see, or I'm sure John will attest to, uh, there's a finite number of times as an agency head, you can come back to your um, elected leaders and say, hey, that thing we were doing, you spent a bunch of money on, yeah, it didn't work. And we're gonna have to try something else out. That, that's just not part of the culture in government. Uh, and it, it's not something you can do very often. Unfortunately, it's what's required if you want to move outside of your comfort zone and you want to try to do something other than what uh, has always been done. In our case, what's always been done is to put a whole bunch of firefighters and throw them against the problem of a fire which is fine until the fire is too big to be put out. And then we need to start thinking about some more innovative ways to address this problem. So um, first thing we did, we took the, um, the communities of Moraga and Arinda, where the fire district uh, is responsible, and we broke them up into a series of um, sub boxes or evacuation zones. And this is the sort of thing that if you're in a major metropolitan area on a grid system street, you just call out a series of street corners and that becomes your evacuation zone. 
Well, in a community such as this one, there's not a straight line in the entire community. So breaking this up and creating a understood mosaic of evacuation zones that can be accessed remotely and create the base for a common operating picture. So just remember this, we'll come back to that. So that was thing one, not a lot of innovation there, but it just wasn't being done. So it qualified as innovation. The base for this was we used Nextdoor, the social media company, we used their neighborhood zones because they were understood and they exist. So we just scraped that from their website and used it. Don't tell them because we didn't attribute that. But um, we since refined it. So John, you can breathe deeply. We're not still doing that. But that was our baseline was, hey, look, these guys have figured out how to break up the community. They've established a thriving information sharing network within that community based on things like availability of babysitters and who's getting rid of their old stroller. Well, why don't we try to use that same basis as, as the foundation to form an a common operating picture and evacuation system. All right, so that's what our zones looked like by the time we got done putting our stamp on it and posting them. Um, we know that uh, evacuation is a law enforcement function, but here's, herein lies the rub of interagency cooperation. By state law, the police department is responsible for evacuations. By state law, only the police department can order an evacuation and only the police department can close a public road. The fire department cannot do that. On the other hand, just as a matter of practicality, the police department doesn't know anything about fire spread. That's not what they do. So in this case, the fire department has the context of what needs to be evacuated, but the police department has the authority. So there's a problem there because we're not gonna be co-located. And when we're in these emergent circumstances, we all revert to job speak. We speak in code. And if you listen to a police scanner or fire department radios during a fire, it, the fire department, I can understand it perfectly. The police department one, I have no idea what they're talking about because they're talking in 10 codes and all kinds of other weird police department things that I, I just, my ear isn't trained to them. Same, same when it comes to fire. So we've established a communications barrier right from the get-go. And yet further, the police department has the authority, but they don't have the means because the evacuation order, the thing that actually goes to residents and tells them to run for it, that in our county is run by the community warning system, which is run by the Office of Emergency Services, which is under the Sheriff's Department, which is not the same as the police department. And to compound all this, not only do we have cultural differences, but we have the tyranny of distance because the fire department is gonna be up on the hill fighting the fire. The police department is gonna be at City Hall or, or some other central location. And OES is gonna be at the county seat, all of which are isolated. So now we're playing telephone between three people who speak a different language at what might be the most chaotic night of their lives. And so it's no wonder that evacuations are always a hot mess because under these circumstances, how in the world could you execute a complex and dynamic thing that you have never rehearsed? So that was the problem we set out to solve. So this first thing we did is to, we took that base map of evacuations on the left, we did a coincident egress analysis where we take a look at if every roof is assigned a value of one, and every roof is assigned a flow path of the most efficient route they could travel to an evacuation point. And in this case, it's right by the red, um, on the left side, it's right by the red triangle that shows when they exit that neighborhood. And out of this, we can predictively identify where the traffic congestion is going to occur, which starts to give a deployment decision support tool to tell the cops where they should send the officers they have available, which intersections they should be posted at to speed the flow of traffic. And on the right side, we did that entire thing. We did the flow analysis for the entire, the entire district, all 38,000 residents. And out of this, it gives us our travel time. It lets us know who is the farthest removed from a safe area, which in this case is defined as a freeway on-ramp. And when we give that some context by putting that on top of those evacuation zones, we now start setting the stage for prioritized and time-phased evacuations. And the next piece, what's missing is the fire spread, which would bring all this together, right? All right, so fire spread modeling. There's a couple of things to go into it and they're really easy to understand. The first is fuel. What, what kind of fuel is there and what kind of fuel, with what density and what fuel moisture is going to carry the fire? The second is topography. There's nothing we can do about topography, but it's important to understand the topography because it has the effect of channeling the fire and increasing the intensity and the spread rate. And the third is the weather, which while we cannot control and it is hard to predict exactly, we can get within general parameters. And there have been existing programs since the, the seminal work was done by Rothermel in 1972, which resulted in the Farsight program, which was first rolled out in 1998. So this stuff isn't new, 
There are programs that can racket, rapidly calculate fire spread using those three inputs to give the, not only the spread rates for the ground component, but they can reasonably using, I mean, it gets a little sticky because you're, you're trying to predict a stochastic event. So using Monte Carlo simulation, you can predict where the embers are going to blow in live fires. Now it's not as precise as the ground component, but it's good enough for government work and it gives us an idea of who needs to be evacuated. And so with all these, the only thing that's left, because we can, if we'll come back to the fuel in a second, if we've accurately modeled the fuel and we have the ability to read a weather report and we enter the topo maps that have been around forever and ever, we can create near real time fire spread models if we know the ignition point, which goes, we'll talk about both of those in a second. All right, so just remember here, fuel, <laughs> ignition point, once you have those, everything else is essentially on autopilot and then you put them on top of evacuation zones to give them context. And the fuel becomes interesting because in order to accurately predict the fire spread, you need to be able to see the fuel, and not just the fuel in the abstract, but the fuel that will carry the fire. And if the fire is running through the canopy, uh, as in the tops of the trees, and you used an aerial-based platform like aircraft-based LIDAR to collect it, then you know exactly what the canopy looks like and you're all good. An aircraft-based LIDAR just so happens to be the standard fuel collection model that's used for everywhere because it's available and you can fly an airplane over and there's no access requirements. It's very easy to do. The only problem is, is outside of say the coniferous forest of Idaho, fire doesn't burn in the canopy. It burns in the understory. So everyone's with me there, right? I mean, it's pretty basic, right? Fire in the ground, it burns along, doesn't get up into the trees. Okay, good. All right, so the problem is, if you're flying an airplane with a laser beam mounted on its wing pointed down at the ground and there's an intact tree canopy, I don't know if anyone here was a physics minor, but lasers don't go through tree canopy. And if they, someone tries to tell you they do, they're lying to you and they do that a lot. And then when you actually pin it down, they say, well, we're actually modeling what we think might be underneath. You mean you're guessing? Well, hell, let's save the airplane. I could have guessed right out of the gate and saved us all a lot of money. So what they're doing is, is they're flying along, they're getting a laser return on the canopy, and then they're just flat out guessing what's underneath. And the reason that really matters is, is if the fire is not burning in the canopy and the fire is burning in something that you're guessing on, well then we have no idea what the fire is actually going to do. And that is a problem that has not been solved, but the good news is there's a lot of stuff there to solve it. So on the left was our first attempt to solve it. So we took a LiDAR backpack uh, from our friends at Leica um, and we put it on an electric bicycle from our friends at Specialized. And we lit up the volunteers and we had them go right around in the understory looking at the trees from the bottom. At the same time, we took a drone and we strapped a LiDAR unit to the drone and we flew it above the trees and then we flew it under the trees so we can compare it. I will give you the, um, the takeaway from here, don't fly drones under trees. It doesn't work out well over time. Um, fortunately, we, weren't, uh, we, were, we were borrowing, not buying that event or that, uh, that piece of equipment. Now, that LiDAR backpack looks pretty slick, but that's a quarter million dollar backpack. Uh, and they don't actually make them, they just loaned it to us. And not only is it a quarter million dollar backpack, which makes us all really nervous when you put it on an electric bicycle that'll do 20 miles an hour uphill, it collects so much data that it produces this huge problem of who's gonna process all this data and you have way more than you need. So with a little bit of playing around, we figured out that we can use a 360 camera, like a Garmin Verb or a um, Insta360, readily available sports action cameras, that, they cost about 400 bucks. And we can create a point cloud that accurately recreates what the ground-based LiDAR unit saw, but at 400 bucks versus 250. And then we can harness the public to go out and collect the data. So that's a great idea. Hey, you wanna help with fire safety? Come get this 360 camera, or better yet, go buy your own. Drop your data collection into this portal and we have this huge mass of data, now what do we do with it? Well, we found a partner at INAT who created a, with National, National Geographic, they created a smartphone app that allows you to point your smartphone at a plant and it will categorize it. So you get to show your kids, hey cool, that's a, a monkey fist or whatever it happens to be. It's actually a sticky monkey fist, but that's a different discussion. But they, they, you can go around and categorize these fuels and that's awesome, neat, show your kids. Well, at the same time, the INAT folks are harvesting that data and they're building species density models. So our question with them was, hey, could you do a fuel model, which is much easier than categorizing what species it is, because there's only 13 fuel models. So just, can, and they said, absolutely, we can do that. 
So we were able to take this huge problem of massive amounts of data, and we harnessed it to an existing data collection and categorization system. They threw a little bit of AI in the vision learning space at it, and we're closing in on what will become an accurate and low cost way to model the understory and to revisit that understory on a regular basis. And let me show you, if I can, at the risk of trying to do something in real time, I will try to shift over here to show you a video of the initial collection of how all that came together. Let's see here. If one of you are able to figure out how to, um, how to get, uh, what's it called? Uh, PowerPoint documents to embed, reliably embed uh, video, that would be a great uh, piece of innovation that we could use to help on. Uh, let's see. All right, let's try that. All right, can you guys see it? We're flying in on a space. Everyone got that? Okay, great. So this is where we've incorporated aerial LIDAR. And you see how the trees, when you come in sideways, you can't see underneath the trees, as in there's blank spot as the point cloud falls apart there, because the LIDAR was looking down from above and it couldn't see underneath the trees. I right, just see a hold here in a second, but the trees, you just see a shadow, but you don't see what's underneath the tree. All right, that's what aerial LIDAR gets you. Everyone good on that? Can't see underneath the tree, can't see the bottom part of the canopy? Okay, now we come up to the, the Bear Ridge um, fuel trail, or fire trail. Here we ran ground base. See all of a sudden the under portion of the tree canopies are populated? That was done with a 360 camera. Converted to a point cloud and then incorporated into this. There's, uh, this is, we're actually out doing fuel mitigation when we did this. So this is an area where we have um, fuel mitigation occurring and the point cloud is so accurate, you can count the lug nuts on the truck, which from the air is just not possible. So this is sub centimeter accuracy with a, um, with a low cost, high resolution sports camera. This model, and you can see it's digitized as it reverts to the point cloud, this is a model you can run fire across. So this is a case where we took the state of the art, which is aerial LIDAR, um, use that for the big open areas where you didn't need to see the understory and then stitch that seamlessly with ground-based 360 cameras to create an, a hyper accurate fuel model that we can run prescribed or um, modeled fire across. All right, let me see. Second here. The idea just for whatever it's worth because innovation comes in strange places. Uh, the idea for that being the, the point cloud from a 360 camera came from a YouTube video that some guy randomly posted with his verb. Um, we were playing around, so someone said, hey, have you seen this? Oh, gee, well, if he can do it, we can do it. I think his name was Bubba, and he was from somewhere deep in the south. So we figured we could do at least as well as he could. All right, um, back on track here. Okay, so just as a, just sort of a thought experiment here. Everyone knows the campfire burn paradise, right? Big fire. Everyone who's looked at it knows that paradise is up in the forest and surrounded by trees. That's kind of kept being defined as forested community, yada, yada, yada. This is a screenshot of um, if you do a Google search for Paradise Campfire and then you do images, this is what comes up. So I call your attention to this one here on the top left where it says Paradise. And in the foreground, your eye is drawn to all that destruction. Raise your eye and look what's behind it. Everyone see the intact tree canopy? As in the trees didn't burn? All right, um, same thing with just about all these others. The bottom left here, right? That, that's terrible destruction. And there's a whole bunch of unburned tree canopy in the background. I just offer that up to say challenge the conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom clearly didn't put a whole lot of thought into this. Um, and so in our case, where the community's up in arms that we need to remove trees, which would be hundreds of millions of dollars. In this case, in an environment where both the topography, the weather, and the type of trees suggest those trees are more available to serve as a fuel than they are in this area, the trees didn't burn. So it's just a, it's a really simple thing. It's a kind of a fun one if you ever wanna play stump the chump with people about whether trees burned in paradise, because everyone's seen these pictures. And apparently no one looked at the background because everyone's convinced the trees burned down paradise. All right, so now back to the zones, how we bring it all together. So all of this stuff, and there's a bigger point here, which is things have to have context, okay? So we took the evacuation zones and we now, we use using a um, both canopy and understory fuel model. We've had, we have the fuel model we want. We model the weather, in this case, 24 mile an hour winds, 17% humidity out of the Northeast, which you see in the top right of the, um, of the uh, what's it called, whoops, of the model here. And we show one, three and five hour spread. And then we, we put there under evacuation recommendations, we put a list of the zones that are likely to be impacted by this fire now in an hour, in three hours, in five hours, to create an evacuation decision support tool 
via a readily accessible web-based application, meaning that FIRE can look at it and say, yeah, that looks right. Law can look at it and say, FIRE thinks that's what it looks like, and I don't have to understand a whole bunch of firefighter gibberish that I don't speak. I can look at a picture, his pictures survive translation, and I can say, yes, this is want, what I want, and I can order an evacuation based on this decision support tool. And the police chief can rapidly communicate that information because it's just a login and a link to the community warning system that are actually executing the evacuations. So we create this common operating picture using these, this understood information in advance and bringing it all together so it has context and answers the so what. On the left side is the email alert that that's generating. So um, when we have a sensor that is triggered, uh, we'll talk about the sensors in a second, and we have the fire spread model, we have to share it, shared via an email. And then on the right side, that's integration with Google Maps and Waze so that we can show uh, the portion of the road that we believe is impacted by fire will be closed. So people using common routing software will be routed around the problem rather than run right through the middle of it. Uh, that is, you figure who gets on the road without checking ways first, right? nobody. So let's use ways and let's use ways to our benefit to close roads and route people around the areas we don't want them in. As in, let's use ways to create a personalized evacuation recommendation rather than just telling everyone, hey, there's a fire, good luck, you gotta run for it. All right, so now the last part, as we talked about, is you got all those other pieces, but you gotta figure out where the fire started. Where is the fire? Because the fire spread model that doesn't know where to start doesn't really tell you anything, right? So we have relied on humans to observe fires forever and ever and ever, and that's fine when you're in a populated area with persistent human observation. It just so happens in the fire district here just north of us is a large wilderness watershed area that's on the wrong side of a ridge from the populated area and there's no one up there. And so my concern was if a fire started in that area, it would be so big before we knew about it that it would be too big to stop. So we, we used a number of ideas. Uh, satellites, specifically low earth orbit satellites, provide persistent coverage and uh, extraordinary detection, like very small fire detection. They're not quite here yet, but they're coming online really, really rapidly. Um, HD cameras put up on top of uh, on towers and things. They're not going to detect the fire, but you can use them to validate that there is a fire. And then lastly, we've, we've tried we've played around with using persistent ground based sensors using a low power mesh network using temperature and humidity as the, the most reliable methods to detect a fire. We've deployed a bunch of those. Uh, we're using them for testing and to protect some key sites. All of these, though, if, it, if there's a lot of latency, these have no value whatsoever. Uh, the folks from Planet Labs, when we first started working with them, satellite company, they were really proud of themselves that within six hours of ignition, they had detected the campfire. Within six hours of ignition, the guy with his eyebrows burned off was pounding on the door saying, there's a fire, you need to come help. We knew exactly where the fire was in six hours. There was no value at it. Right, so we need things like under five minutes to get that detection process downloaded, put into a usable format and pushed out to the end user. Anything beyond that, we're just confirming what we already knew, and there's just not a lot of reason for that. And then these have to be integrated because there is no one silver bullet. There are going to be a whole bunch of things that incrementally move the ball forward, and if they're not integrated, uh, we end up in just these little silos that have no value whatsoever. Um, so here's one of our sensors out at a test burn we did last year. Um, you'll note on this one, we'll come back to this in a second, but note that this the sensor is upwind of the fire. It's a backing fire. It's, it's, the fire is moving into the wind, meaning the sensor never saw the convected heat and it never saw the smoke uh, products of combustion coming off the fire because the wind was carrying them the other way. Here's another one of our sensors up on a burn um, with the high school in the background. And here, here we see the results. So if you come from right to left, um, up here on, on the top right, that's humidity. So I'm sorry, it's temperature. So we see as the fire gets to the sensor, we see a spike in temperature, that's no surprise. Um, down below though, this is where the, the sensor saw the products of combustion in advance of the fire's arrival, i.e. the smoke. And one of the products of combustion is H2O. So the sensor is picking up a spike in humidity before the fire arrives. And that turned out to be the most reliable um, pattern to identify that this is a fire, that if you see a spike in humidity followed by a precipitous fall, at the same time, temperature bounces up above about 50 degrees Celsius. That's a fire, for sure. No further confirmation required. Send the cavalry. 
All right, and in this next spike, we have the same thing. That's where we brought a backing fire and a head fire together, and they both kind of converged at the sensor, and, and they work great. On the left side, or in the middle here, this big bump uh, right up between 11.10 and 11.20, that's that backing fire I was talking about. So you, you had a slow increase in temperature, but you never had the spike in humidity because the sensor never saw the smoke. So still, the uh, temps up above 50 C, that was probably a fire. Our, our certainty is not 100%, but it's close enough that we could probably spend the response. On the left side here is where it gets really problematic though. We see these two little bumps where the, uh, the sensor saw a little bit of fire, and we see these two little dips where a little bit of the moisture dried up. This was when we were burning in the control lines before the experiment started. And that signature of the little up and the little down is exactly what it looks like on a cloudy day when the clouds clear. As in the percentage, the prevalence of false positives is through the roof. You can't send a response on this because there's a, there's a real cost to sending a response when you don't need them. So it just goes to say, this stuff is harder than it would seem like it ought to be. Um, and, and you gotta throw some smart people and eventually once you know enough to start training it, some smart AI, because to process this stuff at scale, it's just not something a human can sit there and stare at the bank of screens and to try to figure it out. So once we have that detection, here's a heat map. Our friends at Splunk put this together for us. So this shows where the sensor returns are showing a fire. This creates a graphic display so that the fire crew responding to the fire knows where they're going. Today, in, the, in California, the tech hub of the world, the state of the art is uh, a person calls in and says, I see a fire. They never know where they are, and they can never accurately describe where the fire is or how big it is. We tell the crew, hey, boys, get on the rig, head north, look for smoke. I mean, that is, that's no kidding how it happens today. I, I would suggest that in this day and age, we can do a little better than that. And this heat map is an attempt to, uh, to do just that, to tell them what they're going to and where it is. Okay, so now we put it all together. So this is the automated evacuation decision support tool. So all that other stuff we talked about, all of that, so the ignition detection, the ignition confirmation, the fuel substrate, the fire spread modeling, the evacuation zones, the um, coincident route and traffic flow analysis, all of that comes together to create this thing where from a fire start point up here at the little yellow triangle, using 81 degree temperature, 4% humidity and 20 mile an hour northeast wind, we think that in one hour, ORI 05 and ORI 04 will be affected and it marches out where we think this fire is gonna go. This creates the common operating picture that police, fire and um, dispatch can use to create a common understanding of the problem, come up with a integrated and coordinated plan and to execute that plan in a deliberate manner, as opposed to the state of art now, which is I see a fire, everyone run for it. All right, so these are the things we're working on. Um, I'll, the, the one here on the, the right, I just put it out there because maybe one of you knows someone who can do this. So if you look at the HydroWise, that, that's a screenshot of a web-enabled irrigation system that one of our concerned citizens on the north end of the district put in with a fire protection component, as in he put sprinklers on his roof and around his house. He then gave me access to it. So from my iPad, I can turn his sprinklers on and off. I would do it right now, but he's asked me to stop because there's water goes spraying everywhere. So point of that is, is that if a fire is approaching, I expect him to be evacuated and gone. On the other hand, I expect that I or one of my surrogates will know where the fire is and there will be a moment when it will make sense to turn the sprinklers on to wet that house down so that embers don't land on it in light or that blown leaves and other things are wet down beyond their moisture of extinction so they won't burn. Imagine that at a community-wide scale. So as I talked about, we built that four and a quarter million dollar fuel break, which is growing back by the day, right? That created a fuel break by removing the fuel. On the other hand, we can make the fuel unavailable by wetting it beyond its moisture of extinction. So we can create an ad hoc fuel break on the fly at the time and place that we need it. Because there's a temporal and spatial component to a fuel break and you only hope you put it in the right place. There is no guarantee. And you only have three to five years of residual value from that fuel break. Well, if we can get residents or we can um, incentivize insurance companies or other regulatory agencies that have um, some influence in this area to encourage homeowners to not only put in web-enabled irrigation systems, but put in some extra circuits that will protect their roof and protect the combustible material that's immediately adjacent to the home, and then give their local fire agency control over those systems. Now that starts to sound like innovation using read readily available stuff. You go down to Home Depot today for 30 bucks, you can buy a web-enabled controller, right? 
And, and the hardware is already there, right? As in the pipes are already in the ground and the vast majority of homes in the WUI have while, um, so a reliable internet service. So we have the ability to do all this. We just have to stitch it together. And that's where the hard part kicks in. How do you get people to do this? How do you get them to do it scale? How do you, how do you mobilize the insurance commissioner to allow you to do this through incentivization programs with the insurer in California where you can't write an insurance policy for more than 12 months and you cannot give them something of value that you will take back if they, if they, know, if they don't renew their policy because those are all seen as ways to discourage competition. So go back to the air quality piece. We have all these competing interests which are narrowly focused on their single mandate. And in this case, things that the insurance commissioner has put in place in order to increase and spur competition are actively preventing us from rolling out a low cost, high impact thing that the insurance companies are begging for the chance to support. If anyone's got a bright idea on that, please call me when we're done. I'd love to hear about how we solve it. Uh, talking to you, John. All right, uh, so let me show uh, one more. This just brings together how we're using satellites and stitching all this. Let me pause here. The risk of losing track of my, where in the world? This, um, the screen sharing business is harder than it looks. All right, stopping that one, I apologize. Uh, here, the funny part is I'm selling myself as a tech person too, right? All right, um, let's try to share to screen three. Great, and share. Oh, that's not what I wanted. You can hear the music, I just can't see it. I hope everyone enjoyed seeing my inbox. There we go, all right, can we see that? See the duct tape? All right, great. So there's our sensors um, out duct taped and strapped around an area. Um, duct tape cheap, and I said we have no budget. So this is using 2.4 gigahertz low power mesh, which is not ideal because um, 2.4 gigahertz also happens to be microwaves use and um, ovens, as in every time they hit foliage with a moisture content, they, they excite the water molecules, which heats the leaves, which we don't care about, but it soaks up the RF. So your range falls apart. Um, Here's that HD camera I was talking about. If you look sort of uh, just slightly to the right of the antenna, uh, you will see some smoke here in a moment. There, see that smoke starting to kick up from our prescribed fire? This is what the fire looked like on the ground. Uh, clearing out the understory. You can see how clearly not visible in the sky. Our sensors spread throughout the low intensity understory fire. Um, here's what it looked like from a lot of parts per million going up that keeps air quality nervous and uh, people calling into concerns. The, me the, um, the RF bounced from there up through the satellite system and down to Paris um, where the, the burn monitor, which is uh, analog devices uh, subset was helping us, was monitoring. The French Coca-Cola there to make sure you know it's authentic. That all comes together. We get a detection saying the sensors see a fire. The burn monitor confirms, yep, we have the profile of a fire. This is in fact a fire. That triggers uh, satellite queuing for the next pass of a Planet Lab satellite, which is giving um, sub, uh, between one and three meter resolution, um, depending on how it's processed. So shortly thereafter, the, the, the tasking goes up, tasks the satellite, um, satellite makes a pass. This is what it looks like on the ground. Low intensity fire, moderate smoke production. This triggers a real-time fire spread, uh, like we talked about before, showing where the fire is going to spread to create an evacuation decision support tool for who should be moved to get out of the way of uh, this um, rapidly not spreading fire. The satellite uh, makes a pass, which gives us, uh, is able to pick up the smoke, you get smoke detection. So we confirm, yep, there's in fact a fire there. Uh, fire is still burning there, and that triggers the evacuation decision support model showing the evacuation by hours and which zones will be affected, noting that this crosses out of MOFD's jurisdiction into Berkeley, uh, specifically the Berkeley Lab, uh, UC Berkeley, and the Panoramic Hill uh, neighborhoods. All right, so we can... And obviously this took a whole bunch of partners um, to put together because these aren't the sort of things um, we can do on our own. 
All right. Okay, so the last bit I was going to talk about is, is the distinction between uh, local government and DOD, uh, which John, well, I think it's a value. Um, so I, I, urged, part, I urged him to do this, yes. <laughs> so the, the first thing to say is um, the, the biggest difference is in that DOD, there's an institution, and the institution is holistic. You join the Marine Corps, you're not going to get a better job offer from the Army and leave at some point later in your career. And in local government, if you read anyone's resume, people move around all the time, myself included. So, so there's, a, there's a constant competition and there's an element in local government, I think, where uh, to some degree you have to look out for yourself because particularly in public safety, as a result of the pension systems, no one's around long enough to, to act in a mentor role. And, and in, the, in DOD, specifically in the Marine Corps, it's up or out. So I'm a colonel today. In a couple of years, I'll either be a general or I'll be retired. There, there is no third option. Because if you don't get promoted, you get out um, or you're pushed out. So you're driven to mentor and develop your subordinates because they are literally going to take your place. And you understand in order to protect the institution that the people who take your place better know what they're doing because you're not going to be there. In local government, that's just not the case. Uh, and, and people, there is no up or out and people either sit tight or they move around a lot but it, it creates a real tendency towards looking out for yourself and developing your own career path and your own plan, your own model. And you can see how that would be at odds with the, the desire and the need to innovate because you might not be there long enough to innovate. Innovation comes with risk. And innovation that comes with risk needs to be buffered by an understanding that you're gonna be uh, protected or taken care of or the institution is going to look out for you when things go badly, especially if things go badly because you were daring greatly. And that I think is the biggest distinction between the two that in the military as a lieutenant, I messed up all the time. When I was deploy deployed to Okinawa in 2000, I took 42 Marines over there. <laughs> 10 of my Marines were in the Japanese jail when we came back. It's a very funny story. Um, I'll tell it to you sometime if we meet. But there is, let's put it this way, there was one of my Marines was a tremendous leader and he was more like Darth Vader than Luke Skywalker and he used his powers for evil. And he recruited a whole bunch of other Marines in my platoon to go out and do some nefarious stuff, which they ended up in jail. Anyway, that's a big whoops. Half of the guys you're in charge of don't make it home from the deployment. But it, by the time it got done with it, the institution determined that the mistakes were not necessarily mine, or if they were, it was because I was young and new at this, and that I was worthy of continuing to, to allow to continue along my way. I just can't picture that, that same response to someone in a leader, leadership position in the local government. It's too easy in the face of public government to say, you know what, or public pressure as a response of local government to say, you know what, uh, we're, we're not going to, to do this. Uh, and I think we've seen that borne out recently with a number of the resignations from people who by all accounts were doing their absolute best to either run a city or a police department who have resigned after their organization, their department, members of which did things that they shouldn't have done. Well, that's an awfully high standard to meet that no one in your organization ever does something they shouldn't do when you're running a police department of hundreds if not thousands of officers. So in, in the, the military model, there's just, there's a lot more um, commitment to developing you and you can be I think in many ways much more selfless because the institution is going to take care of you and the institution is going to progress you if you are if you meet and you're qualified and you're, you're doing good things and you have the potential to contribute you're going to be advanced and you're going to move forward um, and that certainly doesn't exist in local government and then there is just such a risk aversion because what we do at a baseline is we keep the lights on and if we can keep the lights on and balance the budget and, and sort of make clucking noises when presented with hard questions uh, in a public setting without actually committing to anything, we're probably going to do okay. Uh, and that, that creates a powerful disincentive to, to making change. And I think what we need to do, sort of my, my challenge for you all, is smart, um, educated, and engaged people who are interested in this space, is we have to find ways to make these things more approachable. And we have to find ways to bring in um, people who know a lot of things from, from the private sector, yet not let them run the show because ultimately they don't know much about the problem set. They know a lot about solving problems, but they don't know much about the problem we're trying to solve for. And what we don't need is a bunch of people coming in and telling us what needs to be done because it happens to match whatever product uh, they have on the shelf uh, or whatever their interest is. And they also don't have any necess necessarily any commitment to the long term. You get quite a few uh, I like to call them disaster tourists. 
People who show up in the immediate aftermath of a disaster who are really interested in the problem, very briefly. Uh, we're certainly experiencing that in fire right now. There are no shortage of people who are glomming on to the idea of wildfire in California. Um, and we benefited from that. We got a, for developing this, we got a seven figure investment, not investment, um, uh, donation from Splunk. But it's not lost in anybody that the three initiatives they funded were fire, human trafficking, and opioids. Talk about disaster tourism. I mean, let's, let's take the three most, at that time, most pressing things and let's throw a bunch of money at it. And I suspect very soon they will have moved on to something else. And, and that's great and we appreciate their support, but it's gonna be hard to build an enduring program based on partnerships that are fickle because people are, are committed to whatever the thing at the moment is. And uh, the manager, the leader, the executive who happens to be interested, who's channeling funds and resources and people towards this problem may very well be onto something new uh, in short order. So, uh, and then the last thing I would say about the difference is um, the, the military has got a hierarchy. I think we all know that. Um, but because it has a hierarchy, at least in my experience as a Marine Corps infantry officer, that hierarchy lends itself to a much more open discourse. Because you don't ever have to worry about offending your boss, because when your boss is done hearing what you have to say, they're going to tell you to shut up. And it's understood that that's when you shut up. Um, you can be much more expressive, you can be much more blunt, and there's much more value based on, uh, placed on truth to power um, than I think there is in, um, in the public sector, particularly when dealing with elected officials. So it, it's a thorny problem, um, and it's a thorny problem that's going to take some smart people to solve, but um, that's what we got you guys uh, involved in all this for. So um, with that, John, is there anything else you'd like me to address or some questions? Or uh, I'd like, like you to take some questions, assuming we have them. I'm, uh, I'm watching the, the board here, so please put your hands up. Okay, first person was Kelly, I think. Keith Winokur, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. This was absolutely fascinating. It's so great to see technology being used um, in these beneficial ways. My question is sort of what happens next with this model? Do other fire districts have the ability to use this? You know, it seems like this should be shared, you know, around everywhere. Um, and sort of along those lines as well, you know, I think about whatever fire district maybe Paradise is in, like what is their ability to sort of self-innovate in this way? Like this technology seems pretty expensive and you guys have the benefit of having these partners, but a lot of fire um, susceptible areas are kind of in more rural and I think less funded places. And how do you also see that being further impacted by COVID and sort of these budget crises that we'll possibly be seeing in the next couple of years? Well, Kelly, great question. I will put the check in the mail. Thank you for asking the perfect question. So, um, so two things. One, uh, early on, uh, we were playing around this stuff and it was working and everyone who saw it said, hey, I want that. Um, and, and our council, esteemed uh, council, was crystal clear with me that I have a job and I couldn't go start a tech company to try to profit from these bright ideas. And so while we're happy to help, we're also realistic that most people aren't going to be able to take sort of the idea and figure it out on their own. So we recruited up a bunch of really smart tech people. Um, Splunk funded the initial, uh, the initial work for that, and they, they started a company that's offering that. We subsequently got funding um, from the Moore Foundation, Google.org, and then a number of community foundations, and this is in the last couple of weeks, to roll this out for six fire-prone counties that are under-resourced. Um, Lake, th those kind of places that, um, Sonoma, uh, that don't have the money to do it themselves. At the same time, this is being uh, fielded in San Mateo County, already has it. Contra Costa and Alameda County as the whole county are rolling it out via grant funding. And as I said, we got foundation support um, as from nonprofits to, to roll this out for those um, under-resourced counties that couldn't afford it themselves. So, so that's, that's what we're doing, but that, that's obviously uh, a stopgap measure because the right answer is this should be a state initiative, I think. I mean, I think we've built something that makes sense. We've um, offered it up to the state over and over and over again. Um, I got the state capitol for the first time since, uh, since the middle school trip up there and we went to see the, the state assembly majority leader and presented and he said, hey, this is great. And it went nowhere because COVID crowded out everything, right? So to the, the second point is budgets were tough already, uh, and that was during good times. Uh, budgets are just fell off a cliff. And, and so the room for innovation just doesn't exist. Um, you know, there are some other initiatives that we've been working, John and I've been working on about things like getting people who are formerly incarcerated, working on hand crews as a way to reduce fuels and become a pathway to reemployment, reintegration. Lots and lots of interest, right? So you talk about money, because this is a no good idea year at the state level. Um, 
And so the We're answer is it, after the governor on this issue, by the way. Uh, uh, so far, not with very much success. Yeah, we're not done though. We're, we haven't given up yet. But my, my point is, is that um, you've got to, building it is neat, building it and then scaling it is hard and takes money. And the stuff that makes the most sense also has some of the fewest commercial applications. Like those zones, super basic, the mo it's the building block for everything else we do. Um, it's gonna be really hard to, for anyone to make a living selling those zones. On the other hand, there's compelling public need. And, and that's where we're able to get some of the philanthropy efforts involved and we hope over time uh, we'll get the state involved. But just for fun though, if you, um, I'd offer up some homework. Um, that initiative has gone forward. All the stuff you saw there, that went forward at the same time that the, office, the State Office of Emergency Services under mandate from the legislator developed a, uh, they, were, they were mandated to create a evacuation task force. And that task force spent a year and a half really studying the problem. And they produced a, um, one page white paper with five bullet points on it. Look it up. Um, that's the state of the art from the state. I will leave my editorial comments at that, but just, you know, kind of compare and contrast that we talked about today. That's what the state did with a year and a half worth of legislator directed effort at the same time. Um, I was sending up white paper after white paper to them saying, hey, there's this awesome idea. And oh, by the way, I'm not selling it. I'm giving it away. Um, and we know it works because we've done proof of concept here. Great question though. Thank you. Um, so I thought, Joseph, did you raise your hand? Uh, I did not. Oh, okay. All right. Then Michael. Hey, thank you so much, Chief Winker. That was incredibly interesting, really astonishing what you've been able to accomplish. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of wondering what political barriers you've experienced to, to trying to scale this up beyond cost. Obviously, cost is um, sort of significant for, for every policy decision, but um, I'm wondering if there's maybe an aversion to it based on its complexity, or maybe legislators don't understand it, or they're worried about um, integrating it with local departments. Yeah, let me close my door before I answer that one. <laughs> so my personal opinion, um, not for attribution, is because there are vendors selling absolute snake oil that already have their hooks in. And something that, that looks and feels like this um, starts to feel like competition to uh, vendors with established personal-based relationship. Uh, who you know essentially have there's regulatory capture, but on in this case is vendor capture. And they've they've got some stuff they're selling. They've got relationships. Um, you know when you go to these, I well, I mean just for whatever it's worth. Uh, two years ago the CPUC convened a wildfire technology summit. Uh, I was one of the speakers. I presented. I mean it wasn't quite as evolved then, but there was the bones were there. I presented exactly what we're doing here and said we're looking for someone to run with it. Um, and some companies I'll leave the names out of it. We're up there presenting. Um, we've taken um, nothing. And we're calling it something and just give us a whole bunch of money and we'll figure out what it is and um, you know they all have former state fire marshals uh, either on their boards or as VPs and all of their um, whatever's they are continue to sort of plod forward so uh, from my perspective at least when it comes to trying to break in with something new um, the, the lobbyist piece the personal relationships the former um, senior government employees who now work in the industries that, that sell into government uh, based on relationships that's the greatest obstacle we've run into so far as far see the best I can tell. But to be honest with you, this is my first crack at this. Uh, and I remain um, bemused <laughs> that it hasn't gone anywhere. Because you'd think at some point someone would say, hey, this, let, let's do this. Um, and it would be off and running. So let me just add, um, you know, there are layers within layers and there are worlds within worlds. And, um, you know, one of the issues, I think, uh, so I'm, I'm general counsel to MOFD, which is a little humorous because as the chief knows, I'm uh, sometimes a little critical of firefighting in its current state. Uh, not, not of the chief, but <laughs> of, of, of where, you know, firefighters are very, very, very expensive. Uh, they, and, uh, you know, well, anyway, there are a lot of critiques of firefighting. Uh, a lot of the firefighting models that exist are, are, are very, very, very old. Um, and they're not technology based. Uh, at least not based on, well, they were technology based, I guess, in the day. Uh, it's just that they haven't evolved very much since. And so, you know, some of the issue too is, you know, you don't have departments around the state clamoring for a technological solution. So that's one thing that's really interesting. Another thing that's really interesting, and I think it's one of the most interesting things I've seen out of everything the chief has done, and it's been a fascinating road. Uh, so we've seen a lot of interesting things is, um, you know, in a, in a, in a, 
firefighters are very politically powerful. Firefighters union is very politically powerful. Now you're sitting there saying, well, of course they would support efforts to suppress fires because if nothing else, they wouldn't have to run into the middle of them, uh, which is probably not real good for them or anybody else, but not really. They view this as a, a little bit of a competitive threat, not because they want fires in fairness, but because this takes money. Uh, it is cheap compared to fighting fires, very cheap compared to fighting fires, uh, but, um, but nonetheless, it takes money and they feel terribly threatened because the public in Moraga Rinda, perhaps elsewhere as well, uh, has gotten increasingly interested in fire prevention. Not a word that you hear very much. Historically, the fire preventer in a department was called, and is still called, the fire marshal. Uh, they happen to have a very good one there, so I'm not painting with too big a brush here, but, and he's relatively new, but, uh, to, you know, but um, the fire marshal, in my experience, is usually um, somebody who knew somebody. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and they're, to say they're not balls of fire would probably be the understatement of the year. Uh, so it hasn't been a world where, you know, we all think of firefighters as big, strong, and handsome, right? Uh, you know, um, nobody really says that about fire marshals. They just don't. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so, you know, so you've got a lot of worlds within worlds here in terms of, of you know, uh, how this works. And interestingly, it's, a, it's an interesting little sub-model of what we start talking about defunding the police, right? Because, um, you know, here you've got very similar idea, right? So defunding the police ostensibly means getting more, what we call, we used to call civilianization, getting more people who are gonna do community work. They're gonna cost you a lot less than a, a cop. It's 250 to $300,000 per cop give, with pension and everything else. Um, but you've got an entrenched, you know, interest, number one, that, that's, that lies in the way of it. And nobody is really willing, and this is where the defund thing I think comes from, nobody's really willing to cut the number of firefighters. Uh, and firefighters, by the way, are, you know, remain relatively popular compared to cops. Uh, um, so, you know, so the challenge becomes a budgetary challenge as well. And, 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 that's, and that's real, I think. So uh, all of those things I think play in um, and, uh, are post, you know, I think indirectly are going to pose problems for us in Sacramento too, because, uh, you know, increasingly firefighters, I and mean, what was fascinating, we had this, this meeting, this board meeting about a month ago, or was it two months ago, I can't remember, uh, where the community, which has joined itself together in these firewise communities, I mentioned earlier that they're now about to consume me and the chief as well, uh, even though they were spurred by the chief, which, you know, I was careful what you, what you ask for, uh, you know, uh, and they got into a food fight basically with the fire union at the board meeting. Uh, and the, the, the firefighters were, I, I think the only word I can say, their representatives were, were stunned. I mean, they, they, they actually did not know what to say. I mean, and they kind of fumbled around about, well, you know, we think stopping fire is a good thing too. I mean, you know, <laughs> they were like really paralyzed. Anyway, long story, but, but interesting. Uh, other questions? All right, I don't see anybody. Um, sure, last shot at the chief here. Uh, oh, there's one, Peter. Sorry, I didn't want to take up space in case anyone else wanted to. Yeah, just to echo everyone else, thank you for this incredibly fascinating talk. Uh, this is just a more, as an outsider, a kind of smaller question, which was how accurate do you find fire spreading models? Um, I asked just because in transportation, which is my field, the dirty secret is some models are really reliable, others aren't, but they all get used. And so, you know, I'm just curious about the state of modeling and where you see that going. Yeah, so I mean, it's hard right now because we have confounding factors of the, the fuel mosaic that the model is running on is generally not very good. So think a transportation model if you didn't know if it was a dirt road or a pothole road or a freeway. Right? I mean, so there is some of that. Um, it's also, um, they all require validation. So what we're doing now is either between the satellites, the ground based camera or humans on the ground. Before we act on anything, it requires a uh, human uh, validation to say that is actually correct. Uh, based on what I'm observing and then 
what I know based on your personal experience. Um, that said, fires are inherently stochastic. So th there's some upper limits to what the model can do uh, based on just, I mean, we know the wind is generally out of the Northeast as a general statement. By the time it gets done wrapping around three different pieces of topography and filtering through the, the trees so that um, the winds aloft are not the same, the winds at mid flame height. Um, there's uh, all these factors that come together. So the models are okay, I think is the best way of putting it, um, but they're better than um, whatever else we have. And they're really, really difficult to train because uh, unlike traffic uh, transportation where every morning we can validate traffic flows based on rush hour, uh, at a known place and, and it's, you can recreate it day over day. That's not the case with fires. And once a fire burns, were it to burn again in that same area, it would be fun, it would be on a different fuel model uh, because it would have consumed all the available fuel. So the, the fire modeling is okay, I think. Um, I think the, that's gonna become, uh, that problem is going to be, is gonna get refined really rapidly once the low earth orbit satellites come online. And we have persistent observation at the meter or less resolution allowing us then to rewind the fires and, and run the models uh, in, in a learning um, manner against those. Right now, we just don't have that though. And so we know where the fire started and we know where it ended up, um, sort of. And, and we're kind of guessing about what the progression looked like in anything less than 12 hour chunks. Thank you. Yeah. But, but yeah, Peter, just you know, to say though, I mean, that the seminal work is still Rothermel's 1972 for um, fire spread and Van Tassel 1977. <laughs> For a scorch height. I mean, this is stuff that there's a lot of room for work to be done in this space. And quite frankly, nobody cared about fire a couple of years ago. Uh, and we have a couple of mega fires, and now all of a sudden we all care. And it's unclear whether that interest is going to survive COVID 19. Uh, Jake, we've got another question. And you're, and you're muted. Sorry. Um, touching on that interest factor, uh, you know, fires, you, you touched on how like naturally they're cyclical and I just off of a lay person's experience living in California, like, you know, there'll be years where it's like a big fire year, but then because there's not fuel there anymore, it won't be. Do you, is that a concern where like on top of COVID and just kind of catastrophe after catastrophe, because just the cyclical nature of these of fires that like interest will dwindle and eventually things will fall off until the next big fire five, 10 years down the road? Or how do you see sort of keeping motivation yeah. on a project like this? Well, all right. So first of all, yeah, you're spot on. I mean, one of the jokes John's heard me say it, that last year was not a big fire year. And it's saying, so, you know, 2019, other than the, the sort of the Kincaid fire sort of saved our bacon because there was an overreaction to a relatively small fire um, and got people remotivated. But if you took out the Kincaid fire, there were no significant fires last year. And so my running joke last year was, man, if we have an earthquake right now, we are done. <laughs> <laughs> because people just aren't capable of keeping two or three disasters on their toes. And, and so that's a real problem. And so, so yes, that's a problem. We're aware of it. We acknowledge it. And short of going to start fires, which we can't do, um, what we can do, though, is, you know, quoting Rahm Emanuel, never let a good crisis go to waste. But we, what we are doing in this moment is we're enshrining many of the things that we think ought to be done and sustained. We're enshrining them in the fire code. And so during this moment of great support, we're locking things into the regulatory environment that, you know, once you have it, you don't undo it. I mean, with the exception of the current administration, you don't undo regulations. That's just not how it works as a general statement. And in fact, there's some specific state statute that say you can't adopt a less restrictive standard. <clears throat> so once we have this more restrictive fire code, that's here to stay. And so that's what we're really trying to slam ahead is moving forward with enshrining formal requirements that capture the known best practices now to include adoption of um, fire hazard severity zones and wildland urban interface fire area declarations that will require the use of ember resistant construction in perpetuity and requiring enhanced vegetation clearance to include pulling, I mean, it seems silly, but we about lost our minds as a community over a proposal in the new fire code that would cause people to remove mulch within two feet of their houses. We're just talking about raking some bark back. That's it. People lost their minds. So, you know, we're, we're taking the interest that's now, uh, we're taking these growing community organizations and their perceived political power. And we're trying to harness those to regulatory changes that will require compliance and will require behaviors in the future that people may no longer have um, the interest for, but it'll just be part of the way things are done here. And for any of you who grew up in the East Coast, the, the line I've been using is to say, 
just as on the East Coast, you go out and you rake and you burn your leaves in the fall, or you rake and you bag them or whatever. But in the fall, everyone cleans up their leaves. That's just part of living on the East Coast. We're trying to enshrine the same behavior that just part of living in the district or really part of living in California is in the spring, you go out, you cut your grass and your weeds, you remove or break up the non-irrigated native brush, you eliminate ladder fuels, and you remove dead or dying trees. And that's just part of living in California in the spring. Yeah, and by the way, uh, as a kid who grew up in Brooklyn, um, I did not know uh, that um, bushes had such a strong constituency. Uh, <laughs> <quibbits. laughs> uh, but it turns out that, 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 that one of the more powerful political forces in suburbia is, is, is bushes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. it's a little, little depressing, but... Uh, <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm the fire chief. Everyone likes the fire chief, right? I'm used to going to going to meetings as sort of a minor local celebrity. And, and I walked into an absolute um, a mix between a beatdown and an ambush with the city council. And really what the core of it was, was a recommendation uh, to remove, cause people to remove mulch within two feet of their houses and to trim up um, privets and other decorative plantings to two feet above the ground next to their houses. 100% guaranteed to reduce fire loss. There's, there's no controversy about that whatsoever. But um, people's concerns about their landscaping, um, obviously, were, uh, were more important than their concerns about losing their insurance or their homes um, or their families during a fire. I mean, it was, it, it, I usually actually have a pretty good idea what I was walking into. I had no idea what I was walking into that night. And, and I took just a, I just took a beating. And he, yeah, he didn't. He didn't exactly take it in stride. By the way, yeah, uh, there, there will be consequences. <laughs> but I mean, the fire code's going to pass. Let's be clear. Right. But it was still yeah. pretty messy getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 if you want an example of the lawyer's role, I mean, the chief has obviously been driving this thing. But uh, this is probably an example that probably talk you out of building to local government, or at least representing fire districts. You would not believe how much time we've had to spend with the lawyers for the cities of Marin, Arinda and Moraga. Well, actually, one's a town, one's a city, but um, debating the fine points of how you measure 15 feet from a road or, um, you know, all of this, the stuff that goes in the fire code. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, uh, but it has taken us literally months of back and forth with these lawyers who are good lawyers, by the way, very good lawyers very high quality players, but, you know, over, over things that, sh you know, rational people should not, have, should not be spending time on. <laughs> but, well, but also, not only should rational people not spend time on, of the three lawyers there, only one represents an agency that's going to have to enforce it. So, I mean, it, it gets, it just, because we got to silly town pretty quickly on some of this stuff. All right. Well, I think uh, we're, we're out of time anyway. Chief, uh, you know, thank you so much for a real masterclass in, uh, uh, you know, in policy at the, at the local level. I, I hope they don't take you seriously on the idea that, uh, that, that there's a lack of creativity or, uh, uh, you know, uh, impediments, because there are impediments, of course, uh, in anything you do. And it is true uh, that, um, you know, that people who take chances of local government are probably at some greater risk of being, being axed. Uh, but, you know, uh, anyway, with that, thank you so much, Chief. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. guys. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate okay. it. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right. All right. We'll see you guys later.